Welcome back at WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are getting up on draft time. I mean, I've had so many conversations around here. We've been discussing, uh, you know, the history of uh, rock and roll and rush and bands and drinking and going out and cicadas and baseball. But finally, we get back to the meat and potatoes and what we do around here, the purple passion we have for the National Football League and the Baltimore Ravens. Roger Goodell will be up uh, late drinking cocoa probably into the evening by the time the Ravens get onto the clock, unless they trade up. Who knows? Eric DeCoste is possible uh, and knows anything's possible. I know he was lying to me on Monday because they call it the Liars Luncheon. This guy covers all things NFL and the draft for Bleacher Report. I'm trying to reach out to anyone that calls themselves a dork, a nerd, or a football geek. I think maybe this guy's all of the above. I know I've been accused of all of that. Brent Sebleski joins us, one of our defending champions from somewhere out in Ohio, somewhere stuck between Cincinnati and Cleveland. What's going on, dude? How are you? I'm doing well, as in the wonderful weather here in Ohio. We had snow this morning, so I have this glare coming in from everywhere. As you can see, the light of God is coming in from behind me, so I apologize for that, anyone who's viewing. But That's overall, why I'm not foolish enough to live in Ohio. <laughs> but you know what? It's a wonderful time of the year, and I actually like the snow because I hate the devil dust that is pollen, and, <laughs> and that usually puts me down for the count. But it, it is going to be a... Very different year, Nestor, in the way that we view this year's draft because of the lack of information and how the, everyone's preparing for this. The best run teams will be the most successful because they will have confidence in their evaluations. And some of these teams that are transitioning into new regimes and new general managers, it's going to be far more difficult because they haven't established those standards for their roster to know exactly who fits their culture. And considering there's lack of medical information, no team visits and so on and so forth. This is, this is just an unprecedented, unprecedented year when it comes to the NFL draft makes it more fun. You, you know, what was interesting for me. I, I, I jumped off a golf course on Monday uh, with Leonard Raskin and our friends at Raskin global playing golf for Mount Washington pediatric. And I jumped off the course to attend the Liars Luncheon. And by the way, I named the Liars Luncheon. So I want to point that out. They, they're now calling it the Liars Luncheon because I named it that 20 years ago because of Marte Jenkins. Eric DaCosta lied to me when he was a, uh, just a college scout uh, that they were going to draft Marte Jenkins. And I made a fool of myself back in 1999. So um, they use the word culture. You just use the word culture. Does he fit into our culture? There's a lot of places don't even know what their culture is in this league, right? I mean, I guess that's your point is that Pittsburgh, Baltimore, New England, you know, a handful of places have a culture. Kansas City has one now, right? Philadelphia thought they had one, then they fired everybody, right? Yeah. So you know, there are places where they've won recently where there isn't a culture. I mean, John Gruden would like to think he has a culture in Las Vegas. He'd be barely got a franchise there. So there, there's a lot of places where they're trying to figure out what their culture is. And then there's places where like Pete Carroll has a quarterback pissed at his culture. Yeah, it's it's very difficult because it's it's a moving scale at times in the way that these teams are built. And you, you brought up two great examples. Just look at the AFC North in general with Pittsburgh and Baltimore. They are so established over decades. You know, in Baltimore, you had Ozzy going into Eric DaCosta with Pittsburgh. It has, uh, it is the best when it comes to stability we've ever seen as, as noted by Mike Tomlin. I texted him the other day. He texted me back. I, I, I threw him some smart Alec thing. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I did send him. Here, here's what I texted him. I said, you are never leaving, and I like it that way. So that yeah. was what I got. So it's it's amazing because, and then you see what had been the antithesis for years in the Cleveland Browns, where they were always turning things over, but they seem to finally have gotten it right, and they're building towards what could ben potentially be their culture and their philosophy. And but it, it it all matters when it comes to sticking to what you believe. And I'll use the Browns as an example because I'm in Ohio and the AFC North and you can find this Ohio where they're gonna win the Super Bowl this year again. I didn't say that. Didn't go that far. And and everyone oh my God, the Browns, they're the flavor you know they were the flavor when they really sucked a couple of years ago. Now yeah. that they're like good and they're the flavor Oh, I had the Believe Land guy on this week, Andy Billman. He's doing yeah. a new thing on the uh, Ray Chapman, the Indians pitcher. And we he and I went back and forth. Go find it at Baltimore. 45 minutes, we went back and, oh, they're going to win the Super Bowl. Uh, well, you live there. You're not like even a Browns fan, are you? 
No, I, I covered the team for years, uh, and obviously we're not we're not pointing towards Cincinnati as winning in Ohio at this juncture. But the reason I brought them up is simple. If you go online, you can find it on Twitter very easily. When Paul De Podesta became uh, entered that team and was serving basically as their de facto CEO, and everyone talked about analytics, analytics, and how the numbers play a role. You can find their guardrails from those initial teams where they were trying to rebuild and what they prioritized and what they were looking for and being very specific in the types of individuals that they wanted, whether they talk about investing in premium positions, how age plays a factor in, uh, in their evaluations and so on and so forth. And when you give that inside look at the way teams operate, as long as they can adhere to what they set forth themselves they have the potential to be successful. It's just when you get those teams to take those chances and there's going to be more chances this year than ever because of the way, not only with the injury histories that I was discussing earlier, but opt outs. And I feel so dirty saying that an opt out is a negative because these are very personal decisions for these young men. And there's a lot of um, family discussion that occurred around them. But at the same time, you weren't on a football for a year, football field on it for a year. You didn't have that developmental time. We don't know exactly who you are as a player, and that's a risk. And that's what the draft comes down to is mitigating risk. And so if you are a team that's very strong in the way you have your approach and you are set in the way you do things, you won't veer too far from what you do. It's those teams, like, say, the Raiders, who have had a history of making poor decisions or going out of their way thinking they have a culture when they have yet to truly establish it. My old pal, Paul D. Podesta. You know, I, I met Paul D. Podesta when he was an intern for the Baltimore Bandits of the American Hockey League uh, back in the day. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I always forget that he's running the Browns. Like, I sort of I, – I got to reestablish with him when he was running the Padres for a little while. My buddy, Freddie Ullman, uh, running my Padres now. I have to adopt them now <laughs> that they're cool again. Uh, Brent Sobleski is here. He does all things draft. Um, you know, for the Ravens, and we talk about culture and bringing players in, the, the deal here is so wide receiver, wide receiver from the fans, right? Yeah. Uh, the edge rush thing is clearly a need they have. I have felt all along until they get a center and get that position right, whether it's Bradley Bozeman, and they've talked that game, he played at Alabama. I would say if he was their best center, he would have been centering already at various points. We'll find out. I like the offensive line to be solidified more. And I'd love to hear your argument for wide receiver. And I'm going to give everybody some oxygen this week. Uh, Peter King's coming on this week. A whole bunch of football people, Mike Silver. And I went at it last week. If you're a football fan, please go check all that out at Baltimore positive. Cause we are sticking to sports. If you look for it, uh, but we're not, if you're not, uh, and certainly not on social media, cause I'm a citizen, but from a football perspective for where the Ravens are for me, the notion that, they're going to have an impact wide receiver. I don't want to say it's laughable. I just want to say they're never going to throw the ball enough to have an impact wide receiver. I think it's more presence. And look, I'm, I'm with you, Nestor, when it comes to that they should invest in the trenches, specifically up front on offense. If not, then looking for an edge rusher on the other side of the ball. So I agree with you there. But if you want to make an argument for wide receiver, it's having that guy that can consistently – length in the field and by length and I mean when you have a run dominant offense obviously which Baltimore does you need someone that doesn't allow the defense to constrict their safeties and bring them down into the box you need a guy who at any at, at a moment's notice will create those plays and they thought that Marquise Brown could be that player he hasn't become said player so do you need someone who's more of a traditional x receiver a guy who's six foot two six foot three maybe a terrorist uh, Marshall um, at the late end of the first round, who has that ability to be a vertical threat consistently that a defense has to account for him and a roll the coverage instead of dropping safeties down into the box. And that's really why you're looking at wide receiver. But if you're to me, I agree with you that while you need that consistent presence on the side outside they currently lack, they're 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 built around being physical. They're built around running the football. They're built around a unique quarterback who is truly special. So why not do what you can to make them to make to maximize that ability? And you didn't even mention it. And I, I know it hasn't come up much lately, but maybe Orlando Brown's not on the team once the end of the draft is over. That's still a possibility as well. So there's your right. Wait, wait, what's the value in him? Come on now. Like, let, talk, talk to me here because I, I hear this and. He's a unique cat. I like his father more than him, by the way. Um, <laughs> and 
but asking out of ball, demanding, bullying your way out of Baltimore, dude, that's the kind of crap that happens in Cleveland. No, no offense. You know, people want out of Cincinnati, you know, Carson Palmer, people want out of, people don't want into Cleveland, right? Nobody asks out of the good ship purple. It's weird. It's a little weirdly selfish for a guy who had money growing up, is running into somebody about to sign a deal that he'd be a right or left tackle for 50, 60, 70 million dollars. It's really weird. I mean, we just I, in 25 years, I've never heard a guy say, I don't want to play in Baltimore because I think I'm something they think I'm something else. There, it's weird. I, it's been weird talking about it the last 12 weeks because we don't do that in Baltimore. We don't have malcontents here often. Well, I'll say this. I under, I fully understand a young man wanting to honor his father's wishes. I get that. Again, very personal decision. It's something that's when Zeus passed away very, very young in life. Obviously, there's a hole there for his son and he'll he'll never be able to fill that. And we can never understand exactly how he felt when that all happened. So I get, I fully understand him wanting to do what his father told me, told him, excuse me. But at the same time, what his father told him is an antiquated point of view. When you look at the NFL today, right tackle is left tackle. There's no differentiation between the two positions. If you are good at them, you are going to be paid basically the same. Look at Trent Brown. Now, obviously they traded him back to New England, but when he hit the market and went to right tackle for the Raiders, he was the highest paid Lyman in the NFL. Lane Johnson plays right tackle for Philadelphia. He, he was the highest paid offensive lineman in the NFL. These guys set records with their with with their contracts. So you can be a right tackle in the NFL and be as highly paid as left. Well, and if you're Orlando Brown and you're as good at right tackle as you think you were, and Ronnie Stanley's here, and you go have a celebration and have a parade, and you're the right tackle in the Super Bowl winning team. I mean, Ricky Wagner got paid. Ryan Jensen got paid. He's going to get paid. You know what I mean? Like, why not win here instead of saying, I'll go play in some Jacksonville, you know, wherever you want to be, you know, wherever that's going to be. It's really strange. And I don't know how much oxygen Eric DaCosta has given it. I feel like I've talked about it more than he has, quite frankly, right? Like even behind closed doors, because I don't think anybody's banging down his door to make Orlando Brown their left tackle by giving away a two and then paying him and then bring I, I, I don't know that the world sees Orlando Brown as a left tackle. Maybe Orlando Brown sees himself that way. But if the world sees him that way, sure, there'll be action. We'll get a one for him. We'll laugh to the bank. I don't know that the league's going to view it that way. Do you? No, I think you hit the nail on the head because obviously Baltimore has allowed his representation to go out there and look for a potential deal. But it's not necessarily just need around the league because obviously there are teams that need left tackles. Indianapolis needs a left tackle. Uh, almost at San Diego. The Chargers need a left tackle. They These are positions that have to be addressed early in this year's draft. But that's the key, right? So while there are multiple teams that have that need at a premium position, at the same time, this is – this is one of the deepest position groups in the class. So are you going to go trade for an Orlando Brown who in very short order will need a long-term extension and you have to pay him a premium uh, to make that deal. But at the same time, you're giving up that asset that you could potentially get a player younger, cheaper in the draft very early, not just day one. You can get a potential starting left tackle, at least by my projections, well into day two. You're talking maybe round three. You're still getting guys that could potentially start very early in their careers on the blind side. So I think that it's, that's all playing a factor right now. It's not just that Brown feels a certain way. It's that the teams that would potentially be interested aren't necessarily going to spend what it takes to acquire him. And that makes the, the market very difficult. Here's Brent Sebleski. He covers things for Bleacher Report, all things draft. And uh, we heard all the liars luncheon this week about where the top heavy part, a lot of quarterbacks. And what is your belief on this draft, your overview of it? I mean, obviously the Ravens have their needs and they will fill them. Yeah, they will. They, they will draft a wide receiver. They will draft offensive linemen. They will draft two edge rushers, I believe, before it's all over with. And I'm of the mindset that if one of the, if a guy on their board at 12 is there at 19 they'll start dealing they'll start throwing three in and then they'll 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 make another deal and deal a four away and get an extra five and a six they'll come out of this with what they want and eric made it very clear as much as through the lies and the whatever was said on monday one thing that was very clear to me is 
they don't feel like they need 12 draft picks. That they had to give a pick away to get a chip, to get a blue chip guy, that they would deal out of 27 back to 20 or 18 or 16. If the number five guy on their board is there at 16, they would they would give away half a draft to go get a player in a position that they like because of that kind of organization. And they love their draft picks. They value their draft picks, but they value them for the specific purpose of dealing them to get Lamar Jackson the way they did. I always remember a quote Ozzy said years ago, manipulate the draft to your liking. And that's the way that I think we'll see this this year operate more than we've ever seen. Because to your point, you have teams like Baltimore who are competitive now. You expect them to go after certain players that they feel can be instant impact rookies. They have the surplus of draft picks to make those type of moves. But then you have the reversal, right? You have teams, let's use Seattle as an example, the Rams, that are, are don't have a ton of draft picks, that will have to move down, that will want to add more assets so they can flesh out their roster. And furthermore, because of the uncertainty we keep mentioning, a lot of teams will highly value trading down for future draft picks, not instant return but for 2020 and 2023 draft picks look at the sam darnold trade the 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 main return on the sam darnold trade was next year and the following year it's not this year that was a six round pick that they got this year from carolina it's a 2022 second rounder and what 2023 third rounder and so when you were able to get put yourself in a class where it's not only will have more certainty around it but more depth. This is one of the thinnest draft classes we've ever had. And it's not just at specific positions. I'm talking overall prospects available that uh, there was a great stat I saw on social media the other day where we've seen fewer prospects sign with representation than we ever have in the NFL draft, at least in recent memory. So knowing that, knowing that maybe your board's not very deep, and I'll point this out real quick that an NFL board usually only ranges around 150 players. There's what, 256 selections. So if you if there's no one there that fits what you want, that, that you still have on your board, I can see a lot of teams moving around to either go up and get a guy they like or move out entirely and get future assets so that they can be more comfortable with who they select a year from now. For me, with uh, this time of year, it's a getting acquainted again, right? Who's quarterbacking where? You know, where, where, where did Carson Wentz go? Oh, he's in Indiana. You, you, we start to learn numbers, names, coaches. Everybody comes out and does their Zoom turn on how much they love their guys and their players, and this is going to be their year and all of that. Teams you're focusing on, because you're you're opining on every picket bleacher report. Mm. You're the draft guy. Um t- Teams like the Ravens perceived to do well because they've always done well in the draft and they've kept their party together. What are you looking for in this thing above and beyond Trevor Lawrence going at one? Well, really the first interesting pick is the third selection with the San Francisco 49ers, because we know they're taking quarterback. You don't give up three first round picks to move up and get Kyle Pitts. And that's no slight against Kyle Pitts. I think he's absolutely phenomenal and the best tight end prospect I've evaluated in 18 classes. When you look at what they're doing, who's going to be their quarterback. And there's so much smoke around Mac Jones, but I kind of, I'm at the point where I'll believe Mac Jones is the quarterback, next quarterback of the 49ers once his name is called. And then I probably won't believe it anyways, because it's not a slight against Mac Jones. He is an exceptional young man. He is a first round talent, but when you take a, a draft pick top five overall, he is supposed to make you better. He's supposed to, it's the impact. He's supposed to, increase your odds of winning and I look at Mac Jones more as a cog in Kyle Shanahan's system than someone that actually broadens the playbook if you bring in a Justin Fields or Kyle Trask you know from North Dakota State or not excuse me not Kyle Trask Trey Lance (laughs) mixing up my quarterbacks here for a second these guys can do more outside the pocket which is a vital component to Kyle Shanahan's offense than Mac Jones ever could And so I look at it as wondering why we keep hearing Mac Jones, Mac Jones, Mac Jones. And then then you have the ripple effect who the whomever they don't select will become hot commodities for those quarterback star teams around the first hour. This draft's really uh, uniquely interesting, right? Like, yes. And everyone will be mocking it differently this week. Absolutely. Because, look, I'm one of those guys that. I have a, a hard, uh, you know, hard rule that when I do mock drafts, I don't add trades. I mean, why add so many different variables to what is already impossible to predict? 
But we know there's going to be movement. Is it going to start at Atlanta at number four? They're looking to potentially trade out. They may even take a quarterback when it's all said and done. Apparently, Arthur Blank, the owner, is interested in these quarterbacks. And when the owner wants something, you're, you tend to oblige. Well, you're they, only getting so many cracks in the top five or you think you're not going exactly. to suck that much for that long. Exactly. And then you start moving down the board, right? You start looking at Detroit and Carolina. And they could take a quarterback. I'm not saying they will, but that there's that slight possibility. If they don't, there are those teams that you're looking to trade up to because who sits at number nine? The Denver Broncos. They're not sold on Drew Locke. So it's this cascade of quarterbacks that's going through this first round that's going to affect everything. And those teams in the back end of the first round could very rightly land significant talents because these quarterbacks are coming off the board so early. It will be the first time in NFL history five quarterbacks will likely go in the top ten. It's never been done. We could have them in the first four picks straight. That's never been done. And so I know I hate talking all the time about the pretty boys behind center that take the snaps, and I wanted to I want to discuss the big uglies and how they can help teams. But at the same time, this year's draft is beholden to where those quarterbacks land and what teams make the power moves to land their favorite signal caller. Brent Zabuski can be found at a Bleacher Report as well as on Twitter and uh, out in Ohio shoveling snow in April and, uh, uh, you know, wait, waiting on Ohio State to return again and all that stuff. We're trying to hate you guys out here. I mean, the, the Maryland people. We're trying to get into this Big Ten thing, uh, at least in lacrosse season we do. Hey, man, take care of yourself. Enjoy your coverage. Enjoy the draft. Eat some wings. You, you know what I mean? I'll be following along. It's uh, – it feels good to have some normalcy, right? You know, yeah. I went out on a golf course to like an event that was in my calendar. I'm putting this crab cake tour together this summer. You won't want to miss that. And I, I, I'm feeling like draft schedule. Ravens play in Vegas this year. Ravens play in Miami. They play in Denver. We play in Chicago and Detroit this year as well. Some good trips, some deep dish pizza, some beach. Um, and, and the Super Bowl's in LA this year. And it's back yeah. a week. Super Bowl's like Valentine's week. It's crazy, right? Well, we, it's all new, right? And, and not just the new stadium in Los Angeles with no one got to enjoy last year, but all, other than the players and personnel. But at the same time, 17 game schedules on the way, sir. And we have to get ready for all of that. We have to look at what's going on. I, to your point about the weather, I was golfing last Saturday. Now here I am in the snow. So that's, that's my plight at the moment. One more reason not to live in Ohio. You visit, <laughs> you don't stay. Appreciate you, Brett. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. All right. It's the second guy from Ohio I've tortured about the Browns this week. They still suck. And even though I took Art Modell's picture off from behind me, doesn't mean Art's not here in my heart. So there, have at that. We are WNST.net, AM 1570. Having wise conversations, wise markets now sponsoring us. Big appreciation. Uh, make sure you're rounding up for MDA. Uh, I learned a lot about that this week. We had a great conversation with Rob Santoni over there. Also, I shopped online for the very first time. I'm not an online <laughs> shopper. It was very, very intimidating. But I made it. And I'm picking my groceries up on uh, Saturday. And it, as it turns out, I still need to run and get something that I forgot to order online. But I'll add it to the to the order. We are WNST.net, AM 1570. Towson, Baltimore, talking NFL draft, getting you ready for next weekend. We are Baltimore Positive. <laughs>